This is Cruise Radio. Now more than ever, you should consider trip insurance for any kind of trip you take, not just cruises. Get a free quote at tripinsurance.com. Broadcasting from the tripinsurance.com studios in Jacksonville, Florida. This is Cruise Radio. Hey, how's it going? Thank you so much for checking out this episode of Cruise Radio, a review of Discovery Princess this week. And as always, staff writer Richard Sims is here with Cruise News, jumping right to him. Hey, Richard. Hey, Doug. Since it's always nice to start things off with a little good news, it looks as if cruising the Caribbean isn't just back, it's it's back in a big way. That is for sure, Doug. So the Caribbean Tourism Organization, or CTO, released information about both how things looked at the end of 2022 and what they're expecting to see in 2023. And the numbers are pretty incredible. For example, the U.S. Virgin Islands is expecting over 450 ships to visit in 2023, and that is up from 250 that stopped there last year. So that's a huge increase. And get this, 1,200 ships visited Cozumel in 2022, which breaks the previous record by, they're saying, 340%, which is (laughs) kind of crazy. Antigua, which is one of my favorite, favorite stops, is expecting to break all of their previous records this year. A lot of this isn't just good for the islands and the cruise lines that visit them, but from the American ports that they're sailing from. For example, Galveston has been expanded by leaps and bounds, and that means there's not only more ships heading for the Caribbean from there, but there's also more money going into the local economy. So no matter how you slice it from the point of view of the islands that are getting more visitors and making more money, the cruise lines, which obviously are doing better than they were a while ago, or the ports, which are seeing an influx of cash, it's just good all around and also good for consumers too because that's uh with all those ship calls that means there's a lot more inventory in the caribbean now yeah that's for sure and that probably means that you know uh, if you follow the law of supply and demand that Mm -hmm. there should be some deals available if you search carefully enough yeah we also have some good news for fans of carnival's older ships who were a little worried following the company's last earnings call what's the story here well Whenever Carnival Corporation says that ships are leaving the fleet, um, but they don't get specific about which ones, people like me who love the older, smaller ships start getting nervous. I mean, we've seen so many of the classic ships go away. You know, the fantasy, the inspiration, the imagination, the list goes on and on and on. So during their last call, they announced that three ships were leaving Carnival Corporation total. Two were coming from Costa, but they didn't say where the third one was coming from. So, you know, you start thinking thinking, "Uh uh-oh, which one of the old ships is in trouble? And I was running through my mind trying to figure out which one it might be. But it turns out that this time it's not a Carnival Cruise Line fleet, but AIDA, the German division of Carnival Corporation. So the AIDA Aura has been part of that fleet since 2003, and it's... uh, now going to be leaving. The good news is that those who want to take a last spin on her, or I suppose if you've never been on that ship before, or even that line, you can do a first and last at the same time. You'll have plenty of time to do it because the Aura has a bunch of really, really great sailings lined up, including some that are like two weeks, three weeks, some exotic destinations. And there's just, there's still time there. They'll be running their final season through, I believe, July of next year. Isn't Aida... Wasn't Elton John a part of like an Aida production at some point? Well, I that was yes, it had no connection to this, but I believe wasn't that like a Broadway show um, about I want to say something about Egypt, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yeah, okay, just wondering. We may be making this up, but Ugh. let's go with it. Yes, and speaking of Carnival Cruise Line, we've heard rumblings that at least one ship in the fleet might face an itinerary change in the future. What's up there? So this is a story that has kind of a wait-and-see element to it. We've heard from guests on board Carnival Panorama that they received notices about future scheduled stops in Mazel Tan. This is due to the increase in violence in the very nearby area of Sonola. Of Sonola. And please forgive me, folks, if I'm pronouncing these things wrong. Like Doug, I don't always necessarily know exactly how to pronounce the, the names of places that we're talking about. But In Sonola, there's a really big battle that's been brewing for a while between the government and drug cartels. And earlier this week, it got very big and very nasty and very violent. And so there was some concern, you know, uh, Mazel Tan is is a little bit away from there, but it's close enough that it's, it's good to be keeping an eye on it. 
And obviously the cruise lines want to do everything in their power to keep passengers safe. That's why they monitor storms and other weather conditions. And it's why they keep an eye on areas where there's local political upheaval, which was the case here. So the letters, the letter that guests on Carnival Panorama have been receiving basically says, look, nothing's changing right now, but we want you to be aware that our itinerary could change and we're looking into alternatives should it be necessary. You know, so far we have not heard of them having to make any changes, but they are very keeping a very, very close eye on the situation so that if it need be, they have other arrangements and they can just take the ship somewhere else. That's one of the great things about a ship is, you know, unlike if your hotel is in the path of a storm, you're going to get hit. If your cruise ship is in the path of a storm, you can move it and go somewhere else. The other thing here is we've also been hearing from passengers on Panorama that the ship is once again having some technical issues, which is causing it to run a little slower than normal. We've heard this a lot with like the Vista class ships. Um, there's no word on whether they'll actually have to skip any ports or whether they're just slowing down enough that they will wind up, you know, running behind and getting to ports a little later than planned. So we'll be keeping an eye on that in the coming weeks. And it looks like Holland America Line is shaking things up when it comes to onboard entertainment. I'll be honest, this one is a little confusing to me. So over the past few years, Holland America has worked really hard to establish itself as a line that people associate with live music and and a diversity of live music. Part of that has been building up and promoting the music walk area, as well as establishing specific themed venues like the Lincoln Center Stage and B.B. King's Blues Club. Now, from what they're saying, it sounds as if the Lincoln Center performances, instead of having their own, you know, grounded venue on board, they're going to become a traveling ensemble playing on different ships around the fleet. Uh, And instead of playing in the Lincoln Center area, they'll be playing on the world stage where a lot of other productions are done. There's no word yet on what the Lincoln Center stage space will morph into or exactly how this will work, given that, you know, a traveling ensemble would seem to indicate that they can't perform on every sailing of every ship. Um, Obviously, it cuts costs because instead of having um, this group of performers on each of the ships that has a Lincoln Center, you know, you have one or maybe two different groups that are traveling around to each of them. So it's obviously a little bit of a cost cutter. I don't know that that's why they're doing it, but it certainly makes sense. Um, Meanwhile, BB Kings is also going to see a change on some ships on the Nordam, Westerdam, Osterdam, and Zoiderdam, the space is going to morph into the Rolling Stone Lounge. Holland America says this will, and I'm quoting here, it will, quote, allow a bigger variety of music, unquote. Although, honestly, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. It's not as if you can't play rock music in a venue that has the name jazz or vice versa. Anyway, some ships in the fleet will continue to have BB Kings, where presumably only blues music will be played because it's a blues club. I'm not 100% sure, but I guess we'll just kind of like have to wait and see as passengers get to experience the new music venues, um, how it how it plays out. See what I did there? Plays oh gosh. out. Yeah, yeah, I saw what you did there. Well, God, I hate to have that job spinning these stories like it's something good when it's really not. Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, I feel like John Heald does that for a living and takes an attack for it all day, every day. There's, there. I used to want to be John Heald, and then I spent time on his Facebook page, and I was like, oh my god, no. All this man does is get attacked all day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I have no desire to become a spin master like that. <laughs> One of the big things we've talked about in the past few weeks is people paying more and getting less. But we have a story today about people just getting more, period. Which is a good thing. It seems as if we have constantly been talking lately about the major cruise lines raising the rates on gratuities or on the internet or worse on both. Um, But I would like for all of those big companies to take a look at American Cruise Line, which is a smaller company. It it operates smaller river boats. They are in the process of updating their onboard internet and they're using Starlink. Um, which they are passing along, which they are doing and passing along no cost to the cruisers. Or I should say, 
it's not an additional fee because smartly American cruise line rolls the price of internet and gratuities into the overall cruise price. So for all we know, they might be charging hundred dollars a day for this amazing new internet service, but you won't know because it's part of the package that you're paying for, as opposed to something that you're paying for separately. And so it becomes very obvious that, you know, that you're paying this extra money. We're seeing more and more cruise companies go the Starlink route. And in every single case, I've heard of. It's been getting rave reviews. Um, it, you know, we actually have a Starlink set up here at the house. We don't use it very often, but we have it set up for if there's, um, you know, if, if our internet goes out or whatever, we can we can link up via Starlink. But hopefully this is a trend we see more of. I know I've said it before, but gosh, man, like being able to, for us to record when I was in the middle of uh, where was I? Glacier National Park in Montana, in that Wi-Fi was faster than my studio here. It's a Starlink's a good thing. That was incredible. Yeah. I would not have believed it if you hadn't told me. I would not have known that you were recording in the middle of you know basically nowhere. Yeah, T-Mobile wouldn't even record, or a T-Mobile or AT and T wouldn't work where I was. But yet Starlink was blazing. So yeah, and uh, and finally here, here's to hoping that the people on the ships we're about to talk about have good internet because they're going to be out there for a little while. Passengers on two MSC ships that left Italy this week, they're going to have plenty of time to get to know one another and use the internet because both the Poesa, is that how you say it? Poesa? I say Poesia, but I'm probably butchering it too. Okay, well, it's an MSC ship, and you know, some, those of you who are familiar with the line will know it better than me. And the Magnifica, they both left Genoa, Italy this week. One will be doing a 117 day cruise, and the other's doing 119 days. What's kind of cool about this is that for the first part of the trip, the ships will basically be doing the same itinerary. You know, they'll look like sailing next to each other and waving from your balconies kind of thing. But somewhere in the med, they'll basically say farewell, part part ways, and each start doing their own separate part of this tour. So they're not doing the whole – it's not like the whole 118 days is going to be uh, the same itinerary. As far as we know, this is the first time two cruise ships have ever left the same port at the same time on world voyages. I have to say, I love cruising. I mean, as people listen to this, I am probably, by the time they listen to this, I'll probably be on the Norwegian gem doing a quick little trip. But I don't think I could do like a hundred day plus trip. I, much as I love it, it then wouldn't be special. It'd basically be like living on a ship. What about you? Couldn't do it for the sheer fact that I like to eat and it, I probably couldn't have that much self-control over 100 days. It's going to be a uh, shoot a tea straight. Yeah, I agree. I'm the same way. I have no self-control. I am a gambler and I am a drinker and I am an eater. So, you know, luckily this trip I'm, I'm on now is only five days. So hopefully I can't do too much damage to my body. But yeah, can you imagine 100 days of eating, drinking and gambling? I wonder no. if you'd get tired of it. Just be like, no, no, I'm done. So you're heading out on Norwegian Gem. When are you? Are you back by the time we record next week on Thursday? I will be back. I will be back in time to do news. Would I leave you hanging? Never. All right, man. Talk to you later. The world is constantly changing. Your place for news is still the same. Online and on demand at cruiseradio.net. A big question we get at Cruise Radio is, how do I know if I need trip insurance? Simple answer. If you're getting on a plane, taking a road trip, or getting on a cruise ship, you need to have travel insurance. Hey, it's Doug Parker for my friends at TripInsurance.com. Not, not only does TripInsurance.com protect your vacation investment, but it also gives you peace of mind in case anything were to go wrong on your trip. How do they do it? They offer three different types of trip insurance policies. Good, better, and best. One policy for every vacation budget. But it doesn't just stop there. They're up to 40% lower when you shop around on other comparison sites. Plus, TripInsurance.com offers 24-hour customer support before, during, and after your trip, online claims assistance, and travel alerts to let you know what's going on at your destination. But find out for yourself. Check out TripInsurance.com. Just back from a cruise? Let's talk about it. Email Doug at cruiseradio.net. Last fall, Kristen and Scott took a little cruise on the love boat sailing on Discovery Princess out of L.A. Kristen joins us on the line. How you doing, stranger? I'm good. Great to hear from you. It says here on the phone log we haven't chatted in well over a year, so it's good to hear your voice. 
far too long. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Now, this was a seven-night Mexican Riviera cruise out of L.A. on Princess Cruise's latest Discovery Princess. Uh, you're out in the uh, St. Louis area. So what made you want to fly west and take this seven-night cruise? Well, because uh, Scott and I are of the generation where we grew up with the original Love Boat TV series show, this was definitely a cruise we did not want to miss. We were originally booked on this cruise when it was supposed to have been in February of 2022 on the Majestic Princess. And of course, due to COVID, that got rescheduled. So um, we opted to go ahead and, and rebook for the for the new date sailing, which was, which was in October. It actually was our third time sailing on Discovery because we did the the first two, the inaugural and the second sailing back in March, April. So we wouldn't necessarily have picked to do Discovery again quite so soon or this itinerary quite so soon. But the Love Boat theme trumped everything on, on making sure that we didn't want to miss this because who knows how long, many times they'll have an opportunity to reunite the remaining the remaining cast members. Yeah, for sure. Now, I know y'all are big Disney fans. Did you squeeze in a trip to Disney this uh, this West Coast visit? Uh, this time we did not. This, this time we specifically just flew out for the cruise and, and flew back home. Gotcha. So you make your way out to L.A. from St. Louis. Uh, any pre-cruise time in the area? We flew in a day early, like we always do, and stayed at the, the Crown Plaza Harbor, which is our, our usual hotel, uh, since it's so convenient for the cruise port. So we just, just early and did dinner, and that was about it. You ever have any issues staying there? I had a, Last time I stayed there, the toilet didn't flush, and the time before that, the AC didn't turn on. We didn't have any issues this time in, with our room. It's not the most up-to-date uh, of hotels, but it, you cannot beat it in terms of its convenient location for the cruise port. I mean, you could practically, if you didn't have a lot of luggage, you could practically walk yourself to the oh, cruise yeah. port. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah. Now, uh, Discovery Princess has Ocean Medallion, which is the token, and you could take care of a lot of stuff, a lot of pre-cruise paperwork before you even board the ship. So let's talk about embarkation. How was embarkation using the Ocean Medallion, and uh, how long did it take you from curb to ship? So the medallion part works great for embarkation. And because we were so excited to get on this cruise, we actually decided to get to the pier quite early. That was really on on us. So we got to the pier a little after nine o'clock and we had to um, stay outside under the big tent that they have there outside of Pier 92, um, probably for a about an hour, hour and 10 minutes. Again, I, I consider that sort of our penalty for being so excited to, to get on this cruise. Mm-hmm. Um, once they actually started embarkation, we were into the uh, the elite lounge area to wait by about 1030 and we were on board by 11 o'clock. So if we had arrived at a more normal time, uh, like we usually do for a cruise, say, you know, a little after 10, 1015, we wouldn't have had that long a wait. So the elite lounge sounds fancy. What are they doing in there? <laughs> uh, pretty much they just offer coffee, water, uh, a few, a few token, uh, breakfast pastries. And it's basically just an, an area segregated off, uh, for those who are at the elite loyalty level. Cause we would board, we board the ship first. Gotcha. And are you just dinging through everything because you have this, the token on you? Cause they mail it to you, correct? Yes, we, we did get the medallions ahead of time. And yeah, I mean, when you when you actually get into the uh, after you go through um, uh, get into the security tent, you know, you scan scan the medallion there. So you don't need to be providing your passport or any of that if you've already taken care of all of that online. And yeah, so that was really quick. And then and then once you got inside through security and uh, to the to the, the check in desks, Uh, Again, the same thing with the medallion. It was very quick. Yeah. Now, since this was your third time sailing Discovery, can you reuse your medallion or is it a new one every cruise? No, it's a new one every cruise because it's personalized with um, the sailing date uh, Mm -hmm. that you have of of your cruise. Uh, It's intended to be, I guess, a commemorative souvenir, if you will. So, no, you get a you get a new medallion for every cruise. Okay, I didn't realize that. Um. And can you like bling it out if you want to then? Like you said, you can customize it, like get your name engraved for the keepsake or anything. They customize it with your name and the date of your sailing um, automatically. You can choose if you want uh, for like a $5 nominal fee, you can choose to have different uh, different artwork designs on the medallion. Um, for instance, on the on when we did Discovery in March and April, because that was our first time on the ship, we chose 
each ship actually has its own specific artwork design. Uh, that's a, that's an option you can choose. And so we did that for our Discovery Cruise in, in March, April. This time around, we just opted for the standard uh, look, which will have, uh, because it's the first year of sailing, the background is white. Um, and then the Sea Witch logo in the middle would be color coordinated to your loyalty level and elite level is black. And so therefore the sea, witch design was black. So that's the, if by, by st- the default option um, is just to have the sea, witch design. But like I said, there's, they have offered, if you're celebrating an occasion, you know, like birthday or anniversary, there's designs for that. If you have a favorite sports team, they've got that. So they have a variety of different options if you want to customize it, but you certainly do not have to. So I know this is your third time going on this ship, and since we didn't talk about it after your first cruise, what were your first impressions boarding Discovery Princess? Uh, well, we've sailed several of this ship's uh, sister class ships before, so we pretty much knew what to expect uh, from a from a decor perspective and a, a ship a ship layout perspective. Um, we really are, are big fans of the of the Royal class um, design. When you walk on board, you come right into what's known as the piazza area and that's very um very beautiful design and and decor we pretty much knew what to expect um so there wasn't anything that really was took us by surprise per se it's a very nice layout class of ship um and we really like it with all the amenities and and features that it has you make your way to your stateroom so what kind of stateroom did you book on this seven night sailing and what did you think of it so we had a ca- what's called a uh, considered a balcony with a partially obstructed view and an extended angled balcony. It was obstructed from the perspective of you could look down and to the right and see lifeboats. Um, we were on emerald deck, so we were we were one deck above where all the lifeboats are, but obstructed. You know, I, okay, so I could see some lifeboats. Big deal. <laughs> I mean, basically, you know, you had a nice full view otherwise. And where we were at, this this was a, a we were midship starboard side, very much close to the, the central area uh, of the ship. We had that extended angled balcony, which meant we get a much bigger balcony than what a normal standard balcony is. And if you're, you're familiar with the trend these days, uh, those, those balconies aren't necessarily very large anymore on mm-hmm. a, a lot of new build ships. So we try to pick out, when we're picking a cabin, we take a very close look at the deck plans and try to see which cabins have those sort of irregularly shaped balconies. Uh, we, tend to, we tend to like those a lot. If you're not comfortable with having your name on the door, can you have them like deactivate that? Like, say, I don't want them knowing where Doug Parker's stateroom is. Not that anyone would come over, but I'm saying, like, could you, for your privacy, could you have that taken off? That's a great question that I I do not know the answer to. I'm not sure about that. Gotcha. All right. So let's talk about food on this seven night cruise. We'll start at the top there at the, uh, it's not the Ocean View Cafe. What does Princess call it? They call it the World Fresh Market. Yes. How was that? It was good. I think that as we've, uh, as more time has passed with the restart of cruising, I think we've started to see more and more um, options that were available in the buffet prior to the pandemic start to make their way back. I felt like when we were on board in March and April that the variety that was on the buffet uh, wasn't wasn't that large. There were certainly large sections of the buffet that seemed to be closed all the time because, of course, the ships weren't really back up at capacity. For this cruise, I, I never actually heard what the, the percentage capacity was, but it had to have been fairly close to full from what I could tell. And so therefore, what I noticed in the, in the buffet is that you started to see uh, a little bit greater variety than what we had seen maybe more close to the resumption of, of cruising with the restart. We ended up eating a few times, you know, for, for breakfast or lunch. And we ended up doing three nights dining in the buffet, the night that they had the uh, special area for Indian theme food, uh, the Mongolian night. We did that. And then the last one was, I think, uh, Italian night in the buffet. So I think we, yeah, we did three nights, three nights dining in the buffet. I like uh, Princess has that little bakery there tucked away in the middle. Always fun to browse through there with a or a walk through there with a big plate. Yeah. I mean, although I, what I have noticed uh, is that I'm not seeing some of the variety 
in the pastries and the desserts mm -hmm. like I saw before the pandemic. I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but it just seemed like I wasn't seeing all of the maybe the fancier pastries uh, like you used to see uh, either in the buffet or even in the International Cafe. It seemed that it was more of a standard selection and it didn't tend to vary. I didn't notice a whole lot. So I was a bit disappointed with that. I was been hoping for seeing some of those really yummy little little desserts come back. Yeah, I always piled my plate with those. What are those things called that look like a sloth, the face of a sloth? Uh, the chocolate croissants. Oh, I, I love okay. those. <laughs> I love that. I've never heard it described as the face it, of a sloth. Well, so well Google, <laughs> yeah, Google a chocolate croissant and Google a sloth, and it kind of has a resemblance there, at least to me. And also, okay. their um, their right. their bread their bread pudding is really awesome with that uh, that mm. vanilla sauce in there. That is good. Yes, yeah, that's, for sure. That's good. Well, how about special? Uh, actually, you know what? Before we get to specialty, let's talk about the main dining room. What there's like three main dining rooms on this ship. So, what dining room were you in, and how was your service throughout? There are three dining rooms, and unlike when we sailed in March and April, at that time they were only using two of the three dining rooms, again, with the capacity. They were back now to using all three of the dining rooms for this cruise. We had any time dining. We date three nights in the main dining room. I think we were in the Skagway dining room twice, and I can't remember what dining room we were in for the third. I don't think we ever set foot in the Juno dining room, which is the one that was closed when we sailed in March and April. So three nights, we did the captain's welcome dinner. Uh, we did the Italian night dinner in the dining room, and we did the uh, the Love Boat Gala menu. So three nights, and we had nice meals. You know, the the food the food quality seemed to me to be about what we usually uh, experience with Princess, and had had good choices there. I would say that in terms of service levels, and that's been, I know, a big topic, of course, you know, uh, you hear in terms of people commenting about service levels these days, that would be the one area where we did seem to see some fairly consistently slow service was when we were in the main dining room. I would say that when we dined there, we would probably be in the main dining room, I would say at least an hour and a half, maybe one night was close to two hours, it wasn't a, a terrible big issue for us. We weren't really pressed for time or to go rush off to, to, to see something um, from an entertainment perspective that that was a big problem. But I, I would say that we did have notice, you know, a, a slower service level in the main dining room in comparison to our good to excellent service that we experienced pretty much anywhere else on the ship. Very good. Now let's talk about uh, what specialty restaurants did you hit on this seven night cruise? So for this cruise, we decided to go to Sabatini's. It had been about three years since we had dined uh, at Sabatini's on board a, a prior Princess cruise. So we thought it was time to uh, revisit Sabatini's again. We had very, very nice, uh, very nice uh, courses and, and choices for that. Dinner was, again, a leisurely affair, probably about two hours, but we were kind of expecting it to be a little bit slower paced, you know, since it is a specialty restaurant. And again, we weren't we weren't pressed for, for time to go anywhere else. Um, but yeah, nice. Um, calamari, burrata cheese, linguine carbonara. You know, we had some very, very nice, very nice, tasty dishes at Sabatini. So it was nice. It was it was good to revisit that since, it, like I said, it had been about three years since we'd been there. Previously, and, yeah, and then after Sabatini's, where'd you go? The other thing that we did, I guess, from especially dining, so to speak, was we did um, have some sushi at the uh, Ocean Terrace Sushi Bar. Um, that is a a, a four fee uh, item. So we we had we had a couple rounds of, of sushi. That was the night that when we then we went up to the buffet and, and had the Mongolian stir fry. So we had a, a two part dinner <laughs> that nice. night. Well, how about like Alfredo's or that salty? Is it called the Salty Pub? That's right there on six seven. Oh or yeah. Eight? So um, well, of course, um, Alfredo's. Yes, that's true. We never miss uh, a visit, at least one to Alfredo's. In fact, I think in this it, it's it's interesting. So on this ship, Alfredo's is named Gigi's. I don't know why. I don't know why they felt the need to change the name from mm -hmm. Alfredo's to Gigi's. It has the exact same menu that Alfredo's does on the other ships. It just has a different name for that venue. So, yeah, we always we always eat there. Uh, that's our tradition for embarkation for lunch. We always we always go to Gigi's, a.k.a. Alfredo's. And then I think we ate. Uh, yeah, we went back to uh, we went back to Gigi's again for another lunch round uh, later in the cruise. So yeah, that's a definite that's a definite must 
always do. They do have the Salty Dog Gastro Pub on this cruise. Uh, again, we did that in March and April, and that was nice. That's uh, a lower price point in terms of a, a fee from a specialty dining perspective. I think it was $12 um, for that. Uh, but we did not do that this particular cruise. And then on the pool deck, they have what's called the Salty Dog Grill. And that has burgers and, and fries and street tacos as part of that. And we did, we did, have, uh, we did eat from there as well. Is Gigi's, uh, Alfredo's and other ships, is that complimentary for both lunch and dinner? Yes, it is. It is completely free. Okay. So it is a wonderful, wonderful option. Yes. Very good. Any other, any other food we're missing out on here? We did, you know, get some light bites for either breakfast, lunch, or perhaps a uh, dinner um, from the International Cafe, uh, which is on in the Piazza. And that also is, is complimentary. Gotcha. Very nice. Let's talk about the entertainment on this seven night cruise. And of course, this was part of the uh, it was a love boat themed cruise. So it incorporates some of the love boat festivities in this entertainment section as well. Sure. Um, so let's start with the, the non low boat uh, portions first. So really, from an entertainment perspective, there were two aspects to it. One was we got to see the production show uh, Spotlight Bar. So that was a new show to Discovery. However, it did not debut until the later part of April. So we it was not showing when we were on in March and April. So that was a definite priority for us, this cruise, to be able to see that. And it was a very excellent show. Great choreography, great mix of uh, song styles, um, and great set design. So that was a definite highlight to see that. The other thing that was really key for us for entertainment is the piano entertainer. So the piano entertainer who was on board for the first two cruises when we were on in March and April, his name is A.J. Clark. Um, and that was the first time that we had ever um, heard him on a princess cruise. He is a phenomenal piano entertainer. He sets up most nights uh, in the crooners piano bar. And he is a fantastic, like I said, he's a fantastic piano entertainer. So we really enjoyed um, listening to him in March and April. He went off Discovery, I think in the fall, did some other ships and then rejoined Discovery. And it just so happened to work out he was rejoining all with this cruise that we were on. So nice. we got to see him again, which made us very happy. So yeah, if, if you have an opportunity to uh, have a sailing that uh, A.J. Clark is your piano entertainer, you will not be disappointed. Um, so those are really the big things from a non-Love Boat entertainment perspective. Now, for the Love Boats, of course, this being the Love Boat theme, there were a variety of different things. So starting with the Sail Away Party on Embarkation Day, they had they had the cast out there on the Lido deck uh, as part of the whole festivities for Sail Away. Uh, so that was that was very that was very cool. That was probably the most memorable Sail Away party <laughs> I've ever uh, I've ever experienced. We had a great view of the cast for that. Then the first Sea Day, they did a renewal of vows ceremony. Uh, in the piazza, and that was led by the Love Boat cast. Um, so Scott and I got to renew our vows, which is something we'd never done. So mm -hmm. um, that was pretty. That was pretty fun. Then most of the rest of the activities that were Love Boat related were concentrated then on the last two days of the cruise because those were the final two sea days. There wasn't a lot that happened during our three port days. So. It would have been nice to have kind of had maybe the, the events sort of sprinkled around a little bit more throughout the, the itinerary, but mm -hmm. that's the way it worked out. Yeah. So the second to the last sea day was when the cast did their big Q&A session uh, in the Princess Theater. That was a fantastic session. And then what we didn't know, they announced to us while we were... Um, at the end of that, was that then they were going to have photo opportunities with the cast in Crooner's Lounge, and that those of us in the theater, we would be forming the line for that event. And it was it had not been publicized in the in the Princess, you know, on the app or through the Princess Patter. So that was uh, so that was a, a pleasant surprise. So we of course immediately got in line for that, and got to have a uh, photo taken with the, with all the cast members. They also attended the new party that Princess is doing in the Piazza. It's called the White and Gold Party. I'm sure you're familiar. A few other cruise lines, they have they have their white parties. Well, Princess has slightly uh, altered that, and they've had the White and Gold uh, Piazza Party, and the cast members uh, showed up for that, um, at least to start with. So that was nice. Then there was a Love Boat trivia 
session that I think uh, Jill was facilitating. We did not uh, try to attend that. I think the crowds for that were going to be absolutely insane. So we did not we did not actually make that event. But we also got to see, uh, so the last C day, Ted Lang, Isaac, did a cocktail demonstration in the piazza. And he did, of course, make his signature Isaac cocktail. So that was, that was fun to watch. And they had other, I think they had a couple other smaller events. And of course, because, of course, the cast was sailing with us, you would just have random possible interactions with, you know, nothing, nothing pre-announced or anything, just, you know, walking, walking by the cast, you know, a cast member uh, in the hallway or seeing them up in the, in the buffet, the night of the captain's circle party, which is the party that princess does for all of the loyalty level members, uh, Bernie Capel and his wife were just sitting in the back of the Vista lounge. And after the party, you know, he was just posing, you know, if you wanted casual photos with him. So there were those sorts of little opportunities, too, besides the, you know, scheduled, more public events. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely uh, well, it was the first time we'd ever done a theme cruise. Oh, I did forget one thing. That's right. There was a Love Boat uh, disco party up on the pool deck one night. That was a lot of fun, too. And and the cast, the cast showed up for that. So there were there were a lot of different events that happened we definitely were we're very happy that we we did this cruise yes. for that reason yeah for sure it sounds like uh, an awesome cruise did y'all have to pay for that renewal you did no absolutely not no that was part of just part of booking the cruise and and uh it was nice we got uh, like i said we did the vow renewal along with a whole bunch of other people all in the piazza and then they had uh, they had little certificates that they had printed up to give us to Note that we renewed our vows on board, you know, the Discovery Princess with the with the Love Boat cast. And so that was really nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, we talked about some of the CD activities with the Love Boat cast and stuff. How were C days as far as crowds and congestion? As I recall, things were good. We didn't tend to spend a lot of time in the main pool deck area. Uh, when we when we were out on the deck, we tended to be at the back pool that's Princess's Infinity Pool. It's a little bit smaller, so it, it can get a little bit crowded. But there's also the Retreat Pool. That's another nice pool option. I think it kind of spread out people fairly well. I, I didn't feel like it was overly overly congested. We could pretty much get, you know, a chair that we wanted any of the time we were looking for one. Okay. And then that Retreat Pool... Um... Well, I don't, I don't know if, it's a, if that's the retreat pool or not. What's what's the one that's actually kind of like? Um, it's almost like it's in an aquarium. Like the hallways go past it, and it's kind of down in the middle there. So there's the there's the thermal spa pool, the thalassotherapy pool. That's that's in what's called the enclave. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the thermal suite area, and that's a completely obviously you know an indoor indoor pool. Yeah, the the retreat pool has it's behind on the back part. Uh, of Lido deck, if I recall right. And there are cabins that flank the outside hallways. So maybe that's what you're thinking of. It is. That's exactly um, the one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it's, I, I think it's, it's a pool that we kind of stumbled across mm-hmm. when we were on the board the first time. And, and <laughs> I felt embarrassed. I really, I realized not until the very last day of this cruise, like, oh, wait, we forgot about the retreat pool. Right. So again, I, I don't <laughs> think it tends to get as congested because it's it's obviously not there in the center, you know, with the movie screen and the area for the band to play. So it it's a quieter, it's a quieter, more enclosed area. Did you do any uh, like thermal suite passes or spa services this cruise? This cruise we did not. Normally, normally we we do, but because we really wanted to be focused on the love boat theming and make sure that we were, you know, took advantage of, um, you know, everything we possibly could, we decided not to do the thermal suite pass for this cruise. Gotcha. Okay. And then, how about the casino as far as the smoking situation in and around it? Yeah. So that was uh, that was a little disappointing because, as I recall from March and April, I didn't really notice much in the way of of smoke outside of the of the casino. This cruise, it was very noticeable to smell outside of the casino. I'm not sure what happened. I'm not sure why the difference. So that was yeah, that was a little disappointing. Yeah, gotcha. All right. Well, let's talk about the ports of call on this seven-night Mexican Riviera cruise. What we'll do is give us the first one, then roll on to the next one. Okay. So our first port was Cabo San Lucas. And for this time, 
all we decided we wanted to do was to have uh, a late lunch at a restaurant that had been recommended to us by uh, by some cruising friends of ours. So we had lunch at what's called the office on the beach. Generally, if unless you're really up for a, a nice long walk, which we did, it's about a, probably about a 10 minute taxi ride from the from the port to the restaurant there. It was very delicious, a little bit pricey, but it was really, really fresh and delicious food. And we just wanted to kind of have a, a chill, low key kind of kind of day with Cabo. So, yeah, just did the just did the lunch there. OK. And then the next port of call. The next port was Mazatlan. And here we decided to do uh, a ship's excursion, and it's called Panoramic Hiking Views to the El Ferro Lighthouse. This tour is advertised as being a strenuous tour. And let me tell you, that is not a joke. You are doing a hike up to this lighthouse. It's about, it's, uh, it's a 745 meter trail followed by 336 steps to get to the top where the lighthouse is. Whew, it was, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was definitely, definitely strenuous. But you have the best, most fantastic views of Mazatlan when, you know, when you get up there. So it's not an excursion we're probably going to do again, but we are glad that we did it. We had a great tour guide and uh, it was a nice day for it. And we definitely got our, we got our exercise in. <laughs> yeah, sounds like it. And where'd you hit next? And then the last port of call was uh, Puerto Vallarta. And here we had arranged for a private excursion with several members from our uh, Cruise Critic Roll Call group. And we did a food tour from Vallarta Food Tours called the Taste of Piti Yal. Um, Piti Yal is a neighborhood that really was more on the outskirts of Puerto Vallarta. But as Puerto Vallarta over time has grown, it's basically grown to encompass and encircle this area, this neighborhood. But this neighborhood is very interesting. You will not see another tourist there. So this was totally eating where where the locals eat. Nice. And we had seven different stops on this food tour. So we had a carnitas taco, a carne asado taco, a seafood tostada, a birria taco, a tamal, um, we had a fruit popsicle for dessert, so it was uh, it was seven different seven different stops. Plus, our tour guide also took us to visit a couple different points of interest: a church, a local tortilla where they make their make the tortillas that many of the restaurants then use. It was a fantastic tour if you're a foodie and you're really interested in getting off the beaten path. It was a it was a fan- fantastic tour. Nice, that sounds fun, and uh, being away from. The masses also yes. is appealing. So, oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So you make your way back to San Pedro, the cruise port for Princess, and uh, um, is it San Pedro? Is, is it the World? Yes. Yeah, World Cruise yeah. Center, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you make your right. way back there. How was your debark? It was great. I mean, we we had decided for this cruise um, that we were going to do a walk off. So we left our cabin about seven fifteen. We got in line about seven thirty for walk off, and we were through customs by seven forty five. So wow, that was, was fast. It was very fast. Yes. Yeah. Uh, during your cruise, they have been really um, touting how fast Princess's Wi Fi is with their low orbit satellites they've been using and all that. Did you notice how fast or how slow it might have been. Mm-hmm. Yes, that was, if there was a, a disappointing part really to the cruise, that would have to be it. I did not know what happened because when we were on Discovery in March and April, when we've been on other other ships since the restart that have had the medallion net upgrade, internet has been fantastic. Absolutely phenomenal. This cruise, it was terrible. You could passably use Facebook and Instagram, but it wasn't great. Twitter and email were were practically unusable for most of the time. We were very, very disappointed with Medallionette. I tried to do some research afterward to find out, was this just a discovery issue? Are other ships having this? And and I've been reading some things about, something about that the satellites that Princess has been using, that they they changed which ones they were using or 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 something. I, I'm not sure, but it's it's definitely a hot button issue. I can tell you in reading the the cruise forums on Princess about what the heck is going on with Medallionet. Because yeah, that's of course one of the things that they have touted is their phenomenal internet speed. And that's been true before, but it certainly was not true on this cruise. And that was that was very, very, very much a surprise. 
Now, with you, you do have to pay for like an extra package, right, for the internet. That's not included. It's not included, okay. right? So we had we had purchased. I forget what the because they, they've changed the names on the packages. But basically, when we booked the cruise, we booked it with the add-on package that was encompassed: uh, gratuities, beverage package, and the medallion net, the Wi-Fi connectivity. So it was all a bundled price, if you will. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. very good. Any first-time tips to offer anyone sailing Discovery Princess? I would say for Discovery, well, one is the, the that retreat pool. Ah, and it was, it's on Sun Deck, my bad. If I think I said Lido Deck before. So the retreat pool on Sun Deck. So again, nice option if you're looking for a quieter pool space, easily overlooked. So that would definitely be a tip. Second tip I would give you is if you're a fan of sitting out on the promenade deck, and as you know, most of most of the new build ships these days, you don't you you've, you've we sacrificed that nice wraparound promenade deck. But there is a small area on the back of the ship, outside of where the Vista Lounge area is, where there are chairs and tables on the promenade deck, and I don't think many people know about those. Again, because that's not a wraparound deck, and you have to really go looking to find them. But it's a very nice little area if you if you're the one that likes to sit out on the promenade deck. There is a small section where there are some chairs and tables available. So check that out if that's something of interest to you. And the other thing, too, is that if you find it very frustrating like we do in trying to look at the day's activities in the Medallion Net app in what's called their journey view, you can actually still see a more traditional listing type of, of the day's activities and what's called the what was, what was known as the Ocean Concierge uh, web page. Those are still available. So you would just bring up the browser on your on your phone or your mobile device and type uh, discovery.princess.com. And that would bring up what's called the Ocean Concierge web page. And you can see the list of activities. And it's far easier to look at the day's activities that way than trying to do that awful scrolling through the journey view in the Medallion End app. Looking back, what was the biggest highlight of this cruise? Well, undoubtedly, of course, it was the fact that it was the the love boat theme cruise. You know, having having the chance to see the cast, you know, in both public events and then, like I said, in the casual, more informal type settings, that was just you know marvelous. Uh, you know, of, of course, you know, we all wish that you know Gavin McLeod was still with us. Um, he is, you know, the of the original cast members, he is the only one that has now passed. But, you know, having having the rest of the cast together, that was just, you know, that was really, really amazing and made it very, very special. So that, of course, has to be the highlight for this cruise. Well, in closing, you've sailed this ship three times now. So what are your final thoughts of Discovery Princess? We love this class of ship. And from my perspective, I feel like Discovery has the best of, of all the options. You know, there's certain venues that might be available on one ship versus another. And with perhaps some people would say the notable exception, there is no Vines wine bar on Discovery. Otherwise, I feel like it's the no trade-off ship. It has all of the other special, you know, dining venues or entertainment venues all in one ship. So we still have to sail Enchanted. That's the last of this class that we haven't sailed yet. But having sailed five of the six, Discovery is definitely has definitely our, been our favorite. Very good. We'll be talking with Kristen about her seven-night sailing on Discovery Princess out of Los Angeles. It was that Love Boat theme cruise. And Kristen, uh, welcome back. I know you have one right around the corner again. So uh, maybe we'll look forward to talking to you after your next cruise. And uh, tell Scott I said Happy New Year. Yes, definitely. Happy New Year as well. All right, Dougie, let's see what we got for you, buddy. Cruise Radio is produced at the TripInsurance.com studios in Jacksonville, Florida. Get cruise news, ship reviews, and money-saving tips every Thursday on Cruise Radio. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show. If you want to help spread the word, give Cruise Radio a five-star review. Find Cruise Radio where you listen to your favorite podcast or online at cruiseradio.net. I'm your announcer.